The Path to Authenticity is brought to you by GIA Miami. Founded by world-class mental health experts, GIA provides advanced care for difficult-to-treat conditions, including anxiety, medication-resistant depression, and obsessive-compulsive disorder. Using state-of-the-art methods, GIA can help people recover from conditions when more traditional approaches can't. Dr. Antonello Bonchi has assembled an expert team serving international clientele in a modern and resplendent Miami setting. If you or someone you love is suffering from depression, anxiety, OCD, or other mental health concerns, call GIA at 833-713-0828. You can learn more about GIA by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting GIAMiami.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Amy Blaschka, and this is The Path to Authenticity. this your first time here thanks for checking it out if not thanks for coming back i'm tom gentry and this is the path to authenticity episode 170 for april 12th 2022 features a conversation with the writer amy blashka so it's been a good week hope you're doing well out there As I record this, I'm traveling tomorrow to South Florida for the first time as a visitor after moving back to Indiana. My son has a show this weekend, so I'm really looking forward to that. It's been a pretty good week. Got some great content coming up for you guys. I want to ask if you like the show and you feel like supporting the show, please check in to Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can gain access to archived episodes, supplemental content like unedited interviews. I generally do a little mini check-in episode every Saturday. I've kind of gotten off track with that, but I'm going to get back to that now that I'm moved and settled. I'll be traveling this Saturday, but I'll get back onto that next Saturday. I post the episodes as soon as they're finished, so usually patrons have access to episodes at least a few days ahead of time. So yeah, it just enables me to improve the quality of the sound you know, get better equipment, microphones, stuff like that, and just to devote more time to doing this work. So if you're so inclined, just humbly, I ask that you uh, support the show. Patreon.com slash the path to authenticity. So here we go. Amy Blaschka. Hope you enjoy it. So, we were just talking before we started recording here. I found you on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell the listeners what it is that you do? Sure. Uh, I am a social media ghostwriter, and I help leaders craft their stories to communicate and connect better. Okay. And now, I think how I found you was maybe a story that you published in fortune Forbes 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 yeah it was an S (laughs) 
So do you have <laughs> One a, of those. <laughs> do you do you have a regular column in Forbes? I, I'm a contributor, yes. Okay. So I publish five articles a month, typically, you know one a week so, you know I double up on the last week of the month if it's a shorter month but yeah okay. i've been doing that yeah gosh maybe it's been a year and a half closing it on two years yeah about a year and a half i'd say well you know that's what i think piqued my interest because you write about career development mm -hmm. and the whole premise of the show is it's about you know, I wanted to create something that can be a resource for people who want to make this transition from doing something for a living to doing what they actually want to be doing. Yeah. You know, I just feel like yeah. we can be so much better for this world if we're doing what we really want to be doing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the story thing, can you go back to that? You help leaders craft their story to communicate and connect better. Okay. So I like to say I offer stories as a service. Okay. And um, it, as you know, when the things that work best, not just on social media, but just in general in life anywhere is something that's more personal, something that's more real, that is based in someone's unique perspective, unique point of view, unique the way they move through the world, the way they see the world. And, you know, I like to say everyone has a story, but not everyone um, leverages its power. You know, it's, you know, you can have two people that have the same, you know, resume. They've worked at this so-and-so company for so long. They've had held this job title, but inevitably they each bring to it a very unique perspective and how they accomplished that job, how they got to that point. And I think that's finding and helping people discover sort of that unique narrative that winds together and weaves together their personal and professional experience. And then how that translates to kind of talk about their um, holistic experience and kind of what brings them to here is, is just, I love that. And people fascinate me. I, I'm really interested in sort of, tapping into what motivates them and, and what, you know, why they do the things they do, what, what are things that they just aspire to. And you touched on this is really, I, I work with a lot of people who are in a career transition, who um, have trouble because maybe forever they were in a well-paying job. It was practical. It was the right thing. And I'm doing this with air quotes, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And they could be financially successful and by all Measure. It's like, oh, you, you great, you, secure job, but miserable. I know because I was one of them. You know, I wasn't always a writer. And for the longest time, I denied that sort of creative Amy because, you know, I, the stories in my head, it's like, oh, that's just a hobby. Oh, that's a nice, oh, you could never make a living doing that. You could never, you know, so you, you could, you know, you, you're born a creative, you grow up that way, you, you have these aspirations, and then you think, oh, no, but I could never do that. Uh, or you have the imposter syndrome. Well, I know I can write, but am I a writer? You, can you complete that I am sentence, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and with authority and feel like you actually believe it and you take that to heart. And the reality is so many people are talented, but they have a really hard time completing that sentence and feeling it because if you don't believe in yourself, how can you expect anyone else to, right? Right. Um, but people spend a lot of time ruminating and just pushing down and denying those parts of themselves that really do ultimately bring them joy and fulfillment. And, and if they work it right, they can make a living doing that and they can help a lot of people and they can do all those things that they want to do um, without, you know, without the, you know, the expense of their happiness and fulfillment. Yeah. You know, I was just having this conversation with someone about the power of words. Mm, my gosh, yes. Oh, they're so powerful. And for good and for bad. Right. You know, um, because I, like I said, I think the stories we tell ourselves are the most important words that we speak because they, they roll around in our brains. We hold on to them. You know, things that people have told us at a very young age, you may have been labeled with, oh, you're a smart kid or you're a creative kid or you're a slow kid or you're that, you know, all those things you right. heard from a, teacher, a parent, a bully, a friend, or whatever, 
you glom onto those and it's really hard to shake because you think, well, that's, I guess that's who I am or who people expect me to be. And until you can get to a point where you realize that you can be like, I, it took me a long time to say, I'm a writer. Um, and now people that know, they're like, well, of course you are, mm-hmm. but you know, it wasn't always that way. And you have to take this leap of faith, but it really starts with you. And, you know, if you're, if you're a writer, or you're a teacher or whatever you want to be, whatever your heart, you know, that is telling you, it starts with you. You, you need to be the first person mm-hmm. to own that, um, before you can really have anyone else believe that and and it's important and we we you know tend to, oh words don't matter whatever you know sticks and stones and what all that but it's true so it starts with you and the, but the words have so much power to help us transform us too mm-hmm. because words can can you know, tear away at somebody they can be used in a negative aspect at propaganda all these bad things or they can be used to uplift and encourage and impact and help others to serve them. And for me, that's what I want my words to do. And mm-hmm. when I work with clients, I want their words to do that ultimately. And yeah, you know, the kind of writing I do isn't geared towards sales per se. Mm-hmm. The ultimate goal is like I said, service over selling that it's really providing value and that it's sharing insights and ultimately connecting and you know, communicating better, which in the long game, because I play the long game, a relationship girl and relationships over transactions, when you build that foundation and you're that kind of a person that is constantly giving value and you're sharing your insights and you're doing these things, people that know, like, and trust you because you've done these things will ultimately want to partner with you, want to work with you, want to hire you all those good things that will come of it. But um, I'm not, I don't believe in the transactional communication. I, I think that's a very limited and potentially negative way to kind of think about words. Um, I just don't see an upside of that. Yeah. So I really try to steer clear of that um, and, and use them for good, for good. Yeah. And, you know, I always think about Eastern philosophy and the use of mantras Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I've used them personally. Um, you know, I, I think it was Yogananda. I picked up a piece of his writings at one point in my life. And, and I guess it was about 10 years ago. There was a mantra in this book that the mantra is every day and in every way I'm getting better and better. Mm-hmm. Say yeah. that 50 times <laughs> and tell me you don't feel better. That's right. I mean, right. it actually changes us. They mm-hmm. really change us. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I was another one of those kids who got that message about writing. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Work at McDonald's so you can write. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When okay. in reality, there are a lot of ways to write and make money. And, being a proficient writer helps you in just about everything you could imagine. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I heard recently, I don't, I don't know where I saw this. I read it somewhere, but the idea that if you really kind of get to the essence of it, we're all writers and we're mm-hmm. constantly writing in our brains. I mean, yeah. <laughs> everything we say, mm-hmm. we've composed. That's right. That's it's right. really true. And, and it has always fascinated me that people get so um, uptight about writing, too. You know, they, mm-hmm. they just think they can't do it. The, although, you know, they have no problem having a conversation with someone. Well, you know, that, that's an interesting point. So most of my clients are what I would call verbally fluent, where they feel most comfortable and they're great at talking and they can, can give a pitch, they can address a board, they can lead a company, they can give a speech, all these things that require those verbal communication skills. They feel very confident in that. And when it comes down to, well, that's great, but I, I need to express myself in the written form. They freeze up. 
Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, to me as a writer, I'm like, oh, that's a shame, you know, so I want to help them. But it's, it's somewhere along it. And they've, I've heard this more than once is that they're like, I suck as a writer. I'm a yeah. horrible writer. I don't know how, you know, and they, and they have so much shame about it. And at least when I work with them, I mean, I'm a ghostwriter. So my name doesn't go on what they put out, but 95% of what I'm doing with them is listening to their words. Right. So then I can put them into a written form. Right. So it sounds like they're writing anyway. They are. And they, and I think there's a misconception that it's like, oh, well, pfft, ghostwriters, that's, just, that's cheating. You know, you're just coming up with stuff to make them sound good. No, I mean, I, I polish what they say, certainly, but it's really, I listen to them speak and we have a conversation and I'm one of those copious note takers, right? So I go through a bajillion of these pilot G2707 mm-hmm. blue pens and legal pads because I'm taking all these handwritten notes because it's as we're talking, I can listen to their cadence, how they phrase things, because I'm a big believer in the way you speak is, should be the way you write, the way you communicate. There should not be that. this, you know, misalignment from that. Otherwise, somebody could read something you wrote or someone helped you write it. And then they meet you in person. It's like, whoa, there's, you're not the same person. Mm-hmm. What, what? It should be exactly the same. And, you know, I think the other thing a lot of um, folks, where they get this fear about writing is it has to be, you know, the same way their, you know, sophomore English teacher told them that it had, you know, had mm-hmm. to be that this is formula where it must be this and this. And it's certainly you need proper grammar and you need this, but if you know those rules, you know how you can also bend them to, right. to work to your effect. And particularly, like I said, if they're uh, an effective speaker and a storyteller, and they know sort of what they want to get across. It's like, okay, th- that's just logistics. We can work with that. But um, it, it's always interesting to me, and this has happened a few times where I've read something that somebody puts out, and I meet them in person, and I'm like, what? What? I'm scratching my head because it's like they they don't they talk very differently than the way they write, which like makes me go, hmm. Well, maybe they didn't write that, or maybe. Maybe there's something more going on there. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think you're, al- I tell them, you're allowed to have your own voice. Mm-hmm. That's what's going to help set you apart. People will be drawn to you because it's you talking. It's not the English teacher's version of what it should sound like, you know. Yeah, you know, most of the editing of that I do of my own writing, I've found over the last couple years it it usually is changing a word because it's not a word I would speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, it might sound really good and really smart and it might be a great yeah. word. Right. What I Love really the word. say, it, <laughs> what I really say. It. <laughs> is this a Tom word? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you know, it, it, it goes to, it speaks to authenticity. Mm-hmm. Am I really, mm-hmm. is this my voice? Am I being me right. or am I trying to be something else or someone else? Right. And I suppose and that, that's really important when it comes to this work you're doing with people is. Oh yeah. The authenticity yeah. thing. It's, it's really important. It's important to me just because I take great pride in what I do and I really truly want to help people, but it's really important for a ghostwriter because you really, you, it's I call it almost like method writing because i put myself literally into to the you know a character so to speak of my clients like okay if we were working you know how would tom say this what did you know what are some things i've heard him say what are the what are the words that keep coming up that he likes to use or maybe there's a certain expression or or he likes to have quick you know what's the cadence of the way he speaks is it does he use like short sentences he mix it up does he like to go on and on how do we do this and <laughs> it's things that they don't even realize yeah but like i said so much of what i'm doing it's like listening and observing and you know when i was a kid i was very shy which people that meet me today are like no no way but um i was always observing and like i said people fascinated me and it wasn't that i was antisocial, but i was quiet and sort of taking it all in and noticing things that other people missed. And I think those are the things that that set of observation and listening and sort of being able to kind of see those things that other people miss because they 
they're too self-involved or they're, you know, busy doing something else. Those are the sort of nuggets, those little bits Mm -hmm. that I love finding in other people. And um, when I bring those and and shine a light on that for them, that like I see their, I see the awesomeness in people Mm -hmm. and I'll like pull it out and I'll say, Oh my gosh, you know, I, this and I can't believe I'm so impressed by you or this and you've done all this. They don't see it in themselves. Nobody does, right? You always, mm-hmm. you're, you know, your own worst critic, right? And oh, I, I'm guilty of this for sure, you know. But, but I love that and being able to pull that out and and it, because it's so them and maybe they're fearful for one reason or like, oh, I can't really be vulnerable. No one would care about that, and that ends up being really who they really are and what matters most to them. And that's, that's a gift. I mean, that I know my clients pay me, but it's really, it's so fulfilling to me because I, I get to enable that sort of transformation. My, my why, my Simon Sinek why is inspiring transformation. So anytime I'm an active participant in one, and it could be as simple as, you know, I I like DIY stuff too, and HGTV, you know, something that anything that kind of transforms for the better is fantastic. So it could be a home improvement project. But I love, love, love when I help somebody else really see and then embrace and kind of step into who they always were, but they just didn't see it in themselves. That's, that's amazing. Okay. I want to ask you a couple things here. So first, what's a typical day look like for you? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, the, the typical day is I don't have a typical day. I, I, you know, I like variety, which is good. What I've tried to do is um, work my calendar and kind of take <laughs> take control of my time so I'm not just kind of off and doing different things. The one thing I have done is um, I do not schedule any client calls or anything on Mondays uh, for a couple reasons. One, practicality, because particularly if I was to have a, a recurring ghostwriting client, we have weekly calls and scheduling something on the Monday is a bad idea because there are a lot of holidays and Monday's mm-hmm. just not, a, it's a tough day because people are starting the week. But for me, I've learned when I start my week, Monday, I actually start on a Sunday, but yeah, just kind of prepping for it. But Mondays, I use most of my morning, it's my good time to write, where I'm creating and I'm happiest there. And I found mm-hmm. that over time. So I'm like, I'm going to keep that and I'm going to protect that time. And then, Typically, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, I will have um, ongoing client calls. And then subsequently, I'll write updates, articles, different things for them because of that. And then I also have, um, sometimes I'll have those on Friday, but I also try to keep those light for the same reason um, as Mondays, just sort of have that sort of ease into the weekend and kind of feel like, okay, is there any other project I need to wrap up? And it gives me actually that extra creativity time. Um, but you know, from a personal side, I, I love the flexibility on autonomy of kind of having my own writing practice, but you know, you also need the discipline of like, okay, we'll get it done, Amy. Right. So I, I know, I know I write best in the morning, so I will do the majority of that in the mornings. And then I will, I'll start my day. Usually my husband and I will work out together. So we get that done. I never, oh gosh, I was never a morning person until I met my husband. He was like the earliest bird ever, even in college where we met. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> you know, even as a kid, I was like, you know, my parents were like, are you still awake? I mean, if I was left to my own devices as a child, it would be I'd wake up at 10 a.m. and I go to bed at 2 a.m. Just naturally, you know, my biorhythms, mm-hmm. everything worked that way. But I've had to adjust. So I do. So we wake up at like 545. Typically, mm-hmm. we'll do a workout and stuff, shower, clean up. And I still have we have two daughters. One's in college and one is still in high school who doesn't yet drive. So I've got to take her to and from school. So once I drop her off, this is what I do do every day, truly, is I go and get my Pete's almond milk latte with cinnamon steamed in the milk. So that's my go-to drink. And that's sort of my signal, like, okay, get that. And then you start your day work-wise. And and then, like, depending on what's going on, um, like this morning was unusual. I had actually... uh, a LinkedIn live interview that I did. And we're doing this one today, a podcast. Um, and then I have to pepper in other things like life stuff. Yeah. So I had like a doctor's appointment in the middle of the day or, okay, well, I need to, you know, I need to cook groceries. So I'll go at random times, but every day is different for me, which 
suits me just fine. I I love that. I I'm one of those people that if I had to do the same thing in the same order in the same time frame day after day, I think I would just I would be a very unhappy Amy. Um, one of our daughters is my opposite in that way, in that she if she could predict and she knows and this is what she wants and she's much more a linear thinker. This this this. She's super happy with that structure. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, have you always been this way, though? This way, meaning well, loving the variety and. Yeah. You know, kind of- now my life is a lot like yours. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, my no day practically is ever the same. No two days. Yeah. But, you know, there was a time in my life when I really did like the structure. Mm-hmm. It just there's some sense of security that I would get from that. And sometimes I kind of miss that or I kind of yeah. feel like I'm floating out there because <laughs> I don't have to be anywhere at eight or nine. <laughs> Most right. of the time um, yes. it feels a little loosey goosey, but, yeah. um, but I think also that's just like breaking out of that social mold that we're mm. taught to live mm-hmm. within that, yeah. This is how your life should look. Right. And oh yes. You know, yeah. for me, one of the things that happened I guess it probably started to really hit me six or eight years ago, you know, is this really how I want to be spending my time? Exactly. I'm not gonna live forever. Mm-hmm. And if I'm, you know, do I really want to, is this what m- I want my life to be like? And yep. at the time, the answer was definitely no. Mm-hmm. But since then, I've crept closer and closer and closer and am the closest ever to it being exactly the way that I want it to be. Now, the the tasks, for the most part, are all there. It's just a matter of fine tuning the atmosphere around me. <laughs> so it's just how I yeah. want it to be. You know, the people, yeah. the living arrangement, all that stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Just enhancing. Well, you know, it's, it's true. Um, and I think that's a big driver for me. This, this really strong undercurrent of freedom and autonomy to sort of build your life the way it makes sense for you rather than you know, it's part of the W2 world forever, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not, I didn't just graduate from college. I've been doing this decades. And you do, you do this, you do this, you do this, you keep going. But I mean, I'm at a point now where, okay, I, I work out of my home and that's great, but I can do this work, not just like, oh, I can get on a plane. I can go anywhere <laughs> and do the work I do. And I do. I mean, my clients are all over the world. I mean, it's really just a matter of, okay, can we find a time that, you know, it isn't like right. the middle of the night for either one of us. So, I mean, and that, I just love that because that gives the freedom because we love to travel too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, an, you can earn a living, you have the freedom, you have autonomy, and I have the, the expression, the, you know, creative expression, which is super important to me. And I'm helping people and, you know, the work I do matters and I'm having an impact. So, it's checking all the boxes. Now, when I, before all this, I, the thing about the structure that I, I liked, it wasn't so much the structure. I liked, I, I liked people and I liked, you know, going in and, and being with the team, mm-hmm. you know, and being, you know, my, my last like job that I was a, the, like W2, I was the CEO of a small business and had built this team, loved them dearly. I mean, just really just everybody was just on fire and just, it was great. So that camaraderie, that sense of community that you have in person with people, that I would I would like to go to work because I liked being in that environment with those people doing things together, collaborating. Mm-hmm. So you miss some of that when you're on your own. So that I think that's a big reason I joke about it that I go to you know, my coffee shop every day. But I'm like the norm of of peeps, you know. They're Amy, you know. They yeah. <laughs> they know my drink. I don't even have to tell them, you know. It's not there every day. So. I get some social interaction there. I, you know, end up inevitably, I'll end up talking to a person, somebody new there, um, you know, somebody else waiting for their coffee. So I get a little bit of that. And I think just, you know, by virtue of, I, I try to make the social media world social, right. And, and getting to know people um, in that way. So it's a little less isolated. Now, you know, when I work, 
I, I don't want to have a million things going on. You know, if my husband works from home the same day, he has music going. He's a loud mm-hmm. talker. <laughs> He's huh. like, all the things I'm like, close your door. You know, it's, it's not that I need absolute silence, but really, I don't want all this other stuff going on. I even mm-hmm. try to like silence my phone and close tabs and everything. I really need to do the deep work or I need to think. So, you know, I love that I can do that. Um, but it wasn't always possible to do that kind of thinking work when you're in an office situation and every two minutes somebody's popping in your office, well, even for good reasons, you just, Mm -hmm. you get that, you don't have the uninterrupted time. So I I really like to have that, but the structure, the structure of having a regular paycheck was nice too. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's, that, that's a good thing. Uh, That was probably the, you know, the best part of the structure was knowing that every two weeks or so you were going to get paid. Um, Whether you generate business or not. Yeah. And it, but it's, it's nice. I think it's just sort of like at this stage of my life, I'm just so, I'm so happy that I am doing what I'm doing because it's allowing me to be more me and to do things that matter with the people that matter. So, you know, even just the flexibility of, and it sounds really silly and mundane, but, oh, I need to I don't know, pick up the dry cleaning or take the dog to the vet. Mm. And, you know, instead of like having to, oh gosh, okay, well, get off work if I, you know, do this and I can only go between this and this. It's, it's really, it's my time and I control it and I set up the parameters. So, you know, if I'm falling behind, it's on me, but it's also like I can work in and I can block off time to do things and work around it. And I, I just love that flexibility. Well, today at about Mm -hmm. one in the afternoon, when it came time to like stop and eat and kind of get out for a little bit. I actually went to the grocery store Mm -hmm. and picked up a few things. Yeah. And I came back and, you know, I was doing, I was doing some stuff on the computer with the podcast, uploading files, doing some editing and stuff, which takes time. And I'm Mm -hmm. chopping vegetables and, you know, and, um, you know, I'm laughing because I do the same thing. Yeah. And I folded a couple loads of laundry today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it just hit me as I'm driving to the hospital or I'm sorry, to the grocery store in the middle of the afternoon, Mm -hmm. how much I value just being able to do that because so many people work 40, 60 hours a week and then they go do that stuff, which is really work. Yeah. When they're off. Right. And, you know, when I'm off for the most part. I get to be off now. Mm-hmm. I could right now I'm working. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, four thirty, five o'clock where you are, but it's closer yeah. to eight where I am. Right. You right. Know? Right. So, but it's worth it because yeah. I don't hate my life and I don't hate my job. Right. You know? so right. And I that is priceless, yeah. you know? And I think until you get to a place when you're in that grind and you're in that world of just the churn, you do what you have to do, whether it's like dealing with a horrible commute, which I did for many, many, many years, you know, mm-hmm. or dealing with horrible, toxic boss or coworker or whatever. You do what you need to do. And then it's funny when you are out of that world, suddenly you, you're like, why did oh, I ever do that? I didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't realize how unhappy I was. Or <laughs> right. I didn't realize how much time I now have because I don't have these things or, or the beauty of, like you said, going to the grocery store. In the middle of the afternoon, when you know you can go in and get out in 10 right, minutes right. versus, you know, oh, it's going to be 40 minutes because there's lines and everybody else is trying to get their dinner too. And, you know, all those things. You And, you know, and the value of your time, I think that as I'm getting older too, is is really, you know, you, you said this earlier, it's we only have so much time on this on this planet and in, in, in this life. And. How do you really want to spend it? And as much as possible, if you can get into the driver's seat of really controlling your time, how you manage it, the types of things you do, the people that you inter- choose to interact with, and those that you don't, mm. because that's part of your environment. I think you make those choices, and they really, people underestimate how much your environment, which includes all those things and peoples and past, all these things, really impact your well-being. Mm-hmm. And you're ultimately your happiness. So, um, you know, it just, just takes a willingness to just sort of step out of that world and kind of realize that there's more, there's more, I promise it's better. 
Well, you know, and really, I mean, we live in this atmosphere of scarcity. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, and I, you know, I'm an addictions counselor. And so mm-hmm. I work with a lot of young guys who are making that transition into manhood or failing to make that transition into manhood. Yeah. So, you know, I meet these parents who like this, this one dad comes to mind who, you know, this kid nearly drank himself to death and mm-hmm. he wants to be a musician. Yeah. Doesn't want to go to college. Never wanted to go to college. Yeah. Um, tried to do it to appease everyone around him at once and then made himself at one point mm-hmm. and then made himself miserable. Now mm-hmm. he's sober for a little while in a structured environment and getting a little time behind him and his dad is, oh my gosh, he's only a few credits away from that accounting degree. You know, <laughs> oh, he doesn't yes. want to be an accountant. He doesn't yes. want to be an accountant. But, you know, yeah. he, he'll, he, yeah. you know, he's only a few credits away. He can always fall back on that. And I'm like, mm. do you want a live son who works at Guitar Center and plays in a bar on Friday and Saturday or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. on weekends? Or do you want a dead accountant? Right. You know, what no, do you want? No, it's true. It's true, you know, and I think the thing is parents get so wrapped up, you know, that their children have to be a reflection back onto them. Right. Like, look what my – and at least where I live, and I'm sure this is true all over the country, this pressure on the kids to perform and you you must get these grades to get into the college to do the thing, to do all this stuff. And, you know, I – I was a good student. I went to college. I got good grades. I graduated. But, you know, we have one daughter that is in her second year of college. Another daughter is her second year of high school. And both of them are so hard on themselves. And if anything, what I keep drilling into them is like, I I don't care. I, I want you to be happy and well. Mm-hmm. Do not stress about the stupid GPA that, you know, in college especially. Right. It's not you know, the older happen. one. I'm like, no one's going to ask you. I promise. <laughs> no, one right. can, yeah, no one cares. <laughs> right. You know, and and it's, and it's oh, mom, I know you say that, but it's still get wound up and stuff. And I end up having to kind of talk her down off of this spiral mm-hmm. of, oh, my God, my, you know, because it, it it's been, she says, this is drilled into me, mom, when we were in high school too, not by me or my, her dad, you know, but, but just this environment of the pressure and the, you, there's only one path. And mm. I think that's, that's a shame. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm like, look, she's in college now and that's great. And she's, she's doing great. She's thriving there, you know, because she's studying the things she wants. She's very engaged, all the things you would hope, um, you know, but it was like, look, if you don't want to go to college or you you have a different interest or a path or something, then that's okay too. It's not going to diminish who I am. You know, it's not right. about me. And I think that's what happens with a lot of birds. Or they start projecting their own fears and the, the stories that someone else has told them. So maybe growing up this dad heard, well, unless you have a, you know, a degree and blah, 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 you're never going to make it. You know, maybe his father told him that. So the only script that he knows is, well, you get that degree and you get a practical job like, you know, being a CPA or, you you know, an accountant, you do this because then that equals success. Right. And, you know, the more we perpetrate this craziness, I mean, there are some for some kids, that's absolutely true. And more power to them if they really, truly, I love numbers. I want to do this. I like that. Great. Do that. But for the rest of the kids adults too that it's like that's not the only path Mm. you can create your own path there's so many different ways and even just we're getting on a tangent now but even just education Mm. right it's you you can get an education in many many different ways and it's not always this one linear way you know you go to you know high school for four years and then you must go to a four-year school you must do this you must do that and no, you don't. No, you don't have to do it that way. Um, but it just gets drilled into kids. It, it's and they feel stuck. Yeah. And I, and then then the shame. I don't want to disappoint my parents. I can't talk to them. They think I should be this. They have. They really are trying to. They they want what's best for me. But in their minds, that's 
get a job so we so you know you're employed. So you're and it's that scarcity of like because if you don't, you'll never have enough, right? And um, so yeah, it's that's a that's scarcity versus abundance. Um, Are you familiar huge. with Sean Anchor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The whole the whole thing about you know, we have this belief that happiness comes from success. Mm -hmm. yet there will always be another carrot dangling mm -hmm. out oh. in front of us and, yeah. and what um, satisfaction we get from reaching any one of them is fleeting. Yes. And, you know, just, it's fascinating to me that the research really shows that happiness is what engenders success. It's not the other way around. Right. You know? Yeah. If I get to this, then I'll be happy. If right. I, you know, fill in the blank and if that's just, oof, yeah, exactly. You, yeah. It's yeah. When you're happy and you're doing what you're, when you're on the right path and you're doing right. what you, I, I call it like the highest and best use of your talents, mm -hmm. right? When you're living in that, Whatever they are, whatever that means to you, and you know that everybody instinctively, I think, knows that whether they deny it or push it down. But when you know, when you're in that place and you're using your gifts in that way, that's when the fulfillment comes. That's when you're in the flow. That's when, you're like, oh, okay, and, and happiest. Yes, and happiest. And, and then when you're happy, it's like energetic. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it just everything. Yeah. Yep. Yes, definitely. Most definitely. It's, so, uh, so how did you become this person who, how did, <laughs> what's your story? How did you end uh, up here? How did I end up here? So, well, I always, as, as a little girl, I told you I was a shy little kid, but I was always a creative kid. Like, so I was the kid um, painting in the corner, making stories, doing stuff, you know, always something like that. And I grew up in a family, love my family, really close knit family three girls. I have an older sister and a younger sister. So I'm in the middle and my older sister, um, super talented, super driven firstborn. Right. So we have, my parents have, uh, like home movies when they're bringing our youngest sister home from the hospital. And my older sister is literally doing cartwheels, right? She's like, oh, you know, doing cartwheels. And I, and it's motion picture, right? I'm sitting there and I'm just like standing quietly and kind of just this little grin on my face. Just, just, and that really summed up. It was like, okay, well, Deb wants the spotlight. She's, she wants it. She's great at it. She's doing it like everything. And so I'm in the core, I'm the creative one, right? You get those labels early. On. Okay. Well, you're doing that. She's, you know, quiet shy, but really just always observing and thinking and whatever. And so I thought, okay, well, I want to, I want to be an artist or I want to be a writer. I want to all these things and you go through school. And so ultimately when I went to um, college, I um, earned a degree in visual arts in film and media to be a filmmaker um, with a minor in communications. And I kept vacillating between you know, do I want to, do I want visual arts is the major? Do I want communication? And I love to write, but I love this idea of storytelling and, um, and filmmaking because you're working collaboratively with people to have some sort of product that ultimately will positively impact others. You will move people emotionally, you know, like mm -hmm. it will just, it will, like it matters and doing work that matters to me and, and creatively was really important. Now, when I was that age, I don't know that I could articulate it in that way, but I, I knew that I, I wanted to be part of something creative like that. Now, so I graduate, get my degree, a really hard time getting a job as a filmmaker. Shocker, right? You graduate the college, you're like, oh, okay. So I was like, well, what else can I do? What else is creative? And I ended up in what I call... Um, agency land. So marketing and advertising agencies, and all, you know, every specialty, all the things. And I did that. It was great. But, you know, I, I, worked, I ended up on the account side. I wasn't, say, the copywriter. Mm -hmm. I'd end up in the account side because, well, you're really good at dealing with people, Amy. Okay. And you know strategy, Amy, but you can talk, you're someone, you're kind of in the middle, like a liaison. You can talk to the creative people in language they understand and they respect that and talk strategy with our clients and they get that. So, and it, which was right. I, I'm always in the middle. That's sort of the, one of those things like, yeah, okay. 
And I stayed on that route and I, and I loved being in that environment with the creative people. Ultimately, um, the last agencies type job I had was a branding consultant, um, at Landor Associates in San Francisco, worldwide branding agency, amazing, you know, um, and you know, you're working with clients like General Mills or Coke or the, the, you, these big people and, and companies and brands. And I loved it because branding, I didn't even realize that was a thing. Um, every touch point, right? So it combines the visual and the verbal. And I'm like, oh my God, I found my help. You know, this is where I need to be. And I loved it. And I did that for a long time, but I was still on the account side, right? So I would be sitting with designers and I'm like, oh, that's cool. I could do this. And that, you know, I like, you know, but they're like, mm-hmm, but you're, you're, you know, you're the consultant, you're the strategy. Pro- oh yeah. Oh yeah. But I know <laughs> this. <or that. laughs> so and it was great. But the other part about that was, you know, at the time, and this was way pre 9-11, right? So I used to, you know, have to take a like a 6 a.m. flight out of SFO to Minneapolis to get the one flight so I could get there to meet with General Mills and present some stuff and then get the three o'clock from Minneapolis back, get back into SFO at like 10 o'clock at night and then drive, you know, get home. And it was just this, though I loved the work, that was a drag. And at the time, my husband and I had gotten married and we we're thinking about starting a family. And it's like, wow, I, you know, and then I ultimately, you know, was pregnant with our oldest daughter. I'm like, I, we can't keep doing this. There's no way. So after I had her, I was like, okay, I can't, at this point, we're living outside of San Francisco and commuting in, which is not a fun commute either. And then on top of that, the the work and the travel with us, I was like, okay, well, I need to do something. So I did something nobody thought I would do. Huge detour for me was becoming a stay-at-home mom for like a year, year and a half. And they're like, Amy, really? Like, I mean, I love kids, but it was like, you need to work. You're not someone who, okay. But we did that and it was a great break. And during that break, it was sort of assessing like, what do I want, right? It, and many times in my life, in my career, it's like, you know, okay, great. This is great. But like, I was always kind of on the fringes of the creative, right? I was in that world. So I kind of justified it to myself, like, even though I'm not the one actually creating, I'm in it. I'm part of it. I love being part of it. You know, you tell yourself enough times, you'll believe it. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I'm, you know, I'm home going, okay, what do I want to do? Well, how do I, how do I do this? I have a young kid, whatever. I need a job job, right? I need something practical. And I ended up landing a job as a CEO in what's called a destination marketing organization, which is travel and tourism. And, um, it sounds like a huge sort of what, how did, where do you go from a branding consultant over to this? But the whole idea of a destination marketing organization is really about telling the story of a destination. It's, it's marketing the destination. It's branding it. It's, it's a, trying to get people to it, right? Just like you would, you know, people to buy Coke or someone to visit, you know, a city, you do this, you go to an amusement park, all the same principles applied. So now it's, instead of dealing with, soda or beer or cereal it's it's a place and it was a challenge but i had no commute so that was great um and i was able to build that but again great you're a ceo but how much farther and farther away do you get from sort of that creative thing mm. i did that for like 10 years and had another daughter while i was there and then okay i'm done with this i break away and i decide to be a consultant and i'm working with like entities. So tourism, travel sort of stuff, because that was the low hanging fruit. It's like, okay, I can easily do this. But I'm still this whole time like, oh, I really want to write. And about the same time, LinkedIn had opened up their platform for anybody to actually publish content. And at that time, it was really more article driven, right? Longer form content. So I started doing that. And lo and behold, I, you know, I'm on the platform more and getting some friends on there and connections and kind of talking about this as it's evolving as a platform. And an influence on there who we'd become close friends. He was the one who was already making his living as a writer. He, you know, I talked to him a lot. He read my, he's like, Amy, you're a writer. You need to write. Oh, I don't know if I could do that, you know, whatever. And it's finally, I still had this consultancy. And I think the last non-creative job that I did was I was hired to do an organizational audit. And it sounds just as sexy <laughs> as you mm. might imagine, right? I mean, like it, you could be great at something and be miserable. And so I did a great job on that report, but it 
wow, it's, you know, ops and infrastructure and all these things. And it was just like, oh my gosh, I was dying a little inside every day. And then I finally made the switch. I'm like, I'm going to write, put myself there, call myself. I'm a writer. And at first I was writing kind of everything because you have this, oh my God, I I have to to make money. I've got to do stuff. Yes, I'll write it all. And went from writing everything to really whittling it down and really finding a niche and really being specific with, you know, who um, I want to work with and, and what I do for them, how I help them. And I think, you know, when you make it easy for people to quickly understand what you do, who you help, it, it, they, they can find you, you know, versus saying I do, and you list eight different things that have no sort of connection between them. I can do this and this and this and this. Well, how can you do any of those really well if you're doing so many of them, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, fast forward and I now have a thriving writing practice where I have amazing clients that really, um, they come to me, which is amazing because of the content I put out. They they like what I have to say and who I am. And, and really all that is, is a product of, you know, me being who I really meant to be, being mm-hmm. creative, Amy, and being authentic to that not my talents and using those in kind of their highest and best use. And, and that attracts the right people to me and we get to work together and I get to do all this cool stuff. So yeah, that's, that's sort of how it all came to be. And I, I'm so happy, you know, I, my only regret is that I didn't step in, you know, stop hiding uh, um, sooner, you know, that I really stepped into who I was meant to be all along earlier, but you can't go back. So I'm just like making the most of, you know, now and the years forward. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I've, well, the, one of the conclusions I've drawn over the years is, you know, I write too, and, and I've given myself so much grief (laughs) for so long for not having, having written a book yet, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. and Eventually, five or six years ago, it hit me, you know, you haven't written it yet because you weren't ready to write what you're supposed to write. Yeah. And if you would have tried, it wouldn't have been anything like what you're writing now. And it's Mm -hmm. true. It's true. And, um, And so it became a matter of just giving myself a break. And Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, I mean, I have written, you know, it's not like I wasn't writing. I was writing all along. Now, not all of it was meant for someone to read other than me, but I was still, (laughs) I was still writing and, and still improving. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and you know, it, we do. We put so much pressure on ourselves and I had to learn that. And mm-hmm. maybe you had to learn what yes. you learned before you could be who you are now. That's right. Well, and it's like, like anybody else, you know, your all your previous experience, life per professional, otherwise really informs who you are. And, you know, when it's your time and you do this and you kind of realize like, Oh yeah, I would be a much different person had I not had the experiences that I did. And even though mine is a very nonlinear path, it's mine, mm-hmm. right? And I own that. And I and that's why I think I am I'm okay with, you know, and I think we should celebrate those that don't always know because we don't know. You know, it's yeah. it's it's really rare that somebody knows deep in their bones who they are and what they're supposed to be doing with their life when they're 18, say years old, or even 20 or 30, you know, and and I think the other part of that is we need to give ourselves permission to change. Right. We all evolve. We're human beings are, you know, we're fluid and we evolve. And and what mattered to me 10 years ago may not matter in 10 years, you know, 10 years Mm -hmm. from now. So it's, you need to be okay with that. And I think shed those things and not, hold on to so tightly the things that really don't serve you anymore. You need to be okay. Whether that's a person, right? Right. Sometimes we have people in our lives that just uh, not really great or, or just a habit or a job or or anything, you know, practice. And it's, and that's just coming back to kind of self-acceptance, I think too. And, you know, I I think creative people in general tend to be very hard on themselves because like you, 
I, I would imagine you feel this way too. Like anything that I put out creatively, I, it's a part of me. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like it's, I t- it's very personal, even if it's not like, you know, personal, personal, it's, I see it as an extension of me that it lives in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. Right. And that can be daunting. Right. And so scary. And you know, it's, I think people that aren't creative by nature may not understand that fully, but, um, but it matters. And I think when, when what you're doing, when you are fully on that path, when you are fully into who you are supposed to be and authentic, whatever you do is going to matter to you. And, mm-hmm. um, you have to kind of surround yourself with other people that can remind you that you don't suck. You're not an imposter. You might just be having a bad moment, day, you know, week, whatever the case may be. And not to really bash yourself because I didn't write enough words or what I wrote is crap or, you know, it's, it's, I'll never get that book done or I want to do this, but I'm not. But, you know, it's, you're right. It's just, it'll come when it's supposed to come and you kind of keep, just keep moving. I think that's the thing. And I'm big on sort of progress, not perfection, right? Because if you're someone who's a lifelong learner, um, and sometimes you learn through failing, right, mm-hmm. or something falling well, through, I, and that <laughs> we sh- hope, hopefully, you know, I hope we well, all I try to we look. all do, yeah. you know, we all do fail. That's right, and either you, you're succeeding or you're learning, mm-hmm. right? So you know, maybe you understand. Well, maybe I won't do that again. Or- well, and you know, the person who succeeds is the one who doesn't stop. After the last mm-hmm. failure, I mean right. that's really. But right. th- this whole idea, I've, I've, this has come up before on the podcast. The whole idea of just this societal thing that we're supposed to know at eighteen, nineteen years old what we're going to do. <laughs> for, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. just the most ridiculous. But but we put so much pressure on our kids and and. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it just, and, and for a long time as a young adult, I had to get past this idea that something was wrong with me because I didn't know and then Mm -hmm. pursue and, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and what I finally realized is no, you know, I'm a guy who feels my way through stuff Mm -hmm. and it works for me and I like it. Right. And I don't have to adhere to anyone else's expectations of, you know, be it education or work or relationships or here's a, here was a big mind blower for me. And I've talked about this a little bit on this podcast too, but a few years ago I was, I, it just kind of hit me, you know, whenever I sleep in, I feel guilty. Like on a Saturday morning or Sunday morning, if I sleep past like nine Uh o'clock, I feel guilty. And, you know, it was, I can still hear my dad, (laughs) get your ass out of that bed. You're not going to sleep the day away on Saturday, you know, and it was this Midwest work Mm -hmm. ethic thing, which I really (laughs) appreciate, Mm -hmm. but I don't have to feel guilty about sleeping until nine o'clock on a Sunday morning at 40 years old. Like, so it was just like, ah, that's a, that's a belief that I can let go of now. That's right. That's right. And you know what? Sometimes, I I mean, I really believe our bodies talk to us all the time and tell us what we need. And if your body maybe just needed some extra rest. Well, that's what it is. You know, (laughs) you just need to honor that. Yeah, no, I mean, intellectually, I knew that's what it was and that's why I was doing it. But, you know, I still had this internal conflict because, you know, the critical parent was telling me to get my ass out of bed. Get up. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how these things just. But they're, they're so deeply ingrained in us, right? That's why, you know, it's, it's, you talked about this earlier, sort of taking time to reflect through a mantra or whatever Mm -hmm. is it's only then when you can kind of quiet everything else and kind of think about it and go, Oh, and you, and you do that, like, Oh my God, like, I didn't even realize, you know, it's kind of that self-awareness to real, Whoa, I'm still carrying that one around. Okay. You know, I can let that one go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, 
you know, for me, the more internal work I do, the happier I am, the, the more authentic I am, then the deeper I can go and, you know, kind of unravel. I, I, I'm like you, like I, I want to know how I tick. I want to mm -hmm. learn about other people. I want to understand yeah. what makes them tick. And that's part of why I started doing this podcast because, yeah. you know, I happen to be trained as a counselor, but I mean, there are things you're taught, but I kind of knew how to do that anyway. Yeah. You know, I've kind of yeah. like people talk to me. People, yeah. <laughs> people like feel comfortable talking to me. Yeah, and that's my thing. People people tell me things, I write their stories. That was my tagline for a long time. Oh, wow. That, that's good. I like that. <laughs> well, I mean, and you're probably like me too, where you sit on a plane and like next to a stranger, and this happens all the time. My family will just roll their eyes and laugh now because it happens every single time. Or you're somewhere randomly in line or people just start talking to me and they end up sharing like deep stuff with me. I don't know if I'm giving off this vibe, but I'm, I'm so curious, right? I'm really curious about people. So I'll end up like hearing, and it's not that I'm initiating necessarily a conversation. They just, well, they just, I don't know. They just tell me things. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I listen. Yeah. Well, for me, cool. it's, I've kidded around about this because I stopped drinking when I was young mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, <laughs> I was the kid who passed out in your recliner or on your sofa or whatever. And now as an adult, um, it, it happens almost every time I'm all about the, I'm, I'm off in the corner with the guy telling me about his existential crisis at oh, the yeah, party, yeah. you know, yes, yes. <laughs> everybody else is, but that's, that's what happens. Yeah. You know, people yeah. just tell me stuff. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, part of it's because I don't know, I, whatever my demeanor, I don't, but I, I'm a good listener and I right? <laughs> affirm people and, you know, I'm yeah. supportive and all that stuff and, and caring. So it's, it's just really, it's funny how we have these natural gifts that, that just kind of. It, it once we learn that we have them and kind of own them, mm -hmm. it helps a lot. Well, and I think that's key, right? Because the things that come easiest to us, we often discount, mm -hmm. right? We think, well, that couldn't possibly be valuable. It's so easy for me. Or, you know, you don't even give it a second thought until you realize, well, maybe it's not so easy for everyone. Right. right? right. That not everyone does this. It doesn't, this doesn't happen. People don't talk to my, you know, my sister this way or my cousin or my mom or my, you know, best friend. It's like, I, this is, wait, wait a minute. Why, why is that? How come, you know, like, and, and you, when you can really have that awareness of like, Oh, okay. And sometimes that happens. I mean, my, you're an adult and you mm -hmm. finally kind of the, you know, connect the dots on this. Right. Because it's so easy to just, if something's easy, we think, you know, big deal, right? Mm -hmm. You think, okay, that's not hard. It's I have to work at something, right? Because you're, again, you're programmed to think, well, you got to work hard in order to do the thing that really matters. So, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, yeah. So, but, but really acknowledging your own gifts and talents, uh, is huge. Well, it's and huge. for me, what's come about is when I begin to acknowledge them myself, Mm -hmm. then naturally I attract people who yeah. do the same. Yeah. Yeah. For Where sure. Before, you know, when I was not seeing them, I wasn't, I wasn't surrounding myself with people who saw them either. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Isn't that funny how that works? It huh? is. It's it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it is, it's wild how, you know, really our outer, the, our outer experience is just a reflection of our inner experience. It's true. I, and I really do think there's something to kind of the energy that you give off and, and what you end up attracting your way. Yeah. Right? If you're, if you're like a really, I don't know, mean spirited, unhappy sort of lot, you're going to, that seems you attract more of that. 
uh, into your life, mm. even if you say you want something else, but you're just like, oh, if you're really consumed with all the bad versus really focused on what you want, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it, there's a shift that occurs for sure. So I, I have to tell you earlier in the conversation, I was listening to you talk about, I mean, you take the ghostwriting thing so seriously. <laughs> I, I guess I've never spoken really to a ghostwriter before, so I've never heard that point of view where, you know, you you really try to inhabit the other person. Yeah. And I'm I was chuckling to myself thinking about the guy who wrote Art of the Deal. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wondering, you know, I never bothered to read it. I mean, it's like the last yeah. thing I'd ever want to read, even yeah. 20 years yeah. ago. But yeah, but it just, I don't know. It's just me. That'd be a difficult assignment for me. I'd that, probably pass. That, on that I one. would pass on that one too. Yeah. You don't want to become that person, right? Yeah. 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 There has to be some alignment naturally right, <laughs> before right. we start. I am not the writer for you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, so oh. last last thing here. So if if you had to go back to a time in your life when Amy there was a time when Amy needed to hear something from you, when would that have been and what would you say to her? I would probably go back to really young Amy and you know, when I was being told I was too sensitive because that happened a lot to me. You know, and I saw that then as a kind of a weakness, like, oh, that must be bad because I, you know, I so easily I, I'm like empathic, right? I, I take on the emotions of somebody else. I can feel very deeply when somebody is hurting or they're happy or all these things. And so I'm, I'm too sensitive, you know, and I still I'll cry commercials and do different things like that. But I would tell young Amy, you know what? That's OK. You're OK. And you need to you own that because guess what? That supposed weakness is going to turn out to be your greatest superpower. So stay with that. I love that. We have a lot in common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we really do. I mean, there are so many things that you said, just my, some of the things about your career where you were creative, but then you also worked on the account side. I mean, that's been the story of, I've had one foot here and one foot there and, you know, I've yeah. been able to help bridge the gap for other people for, mm -hmm. for many years. And, um, you know, which really has kept it interesting mm -hmm. too. It's, it's been, um, you know, it's, there's been some novelty to it and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. You know, if I hadn't done all that, I wouldn't be where I am now, which is, you know, I like it. So but that's right. And I think you tend to appreciate it too, because if it was all smooth sailing, you, you know, there's yeah. no, there's nothing to do. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. you can appreciate it now having been through it all. Well, Amy, it's been a pleasure. Mm, thank and you, I, Tom. It's yeah. been fun chatting. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to send you something I wrote. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. And we definitely have to stay in touch and, um, you didn't even mention that you're writing a novel. No, yeah. <laughs> so maybe you can come back and talk about that sure. the next time. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Yes, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. All yeah. right. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, bye -bye. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. go another episode in the books thanks for listening you can learn more about the show and this episode's guest at the path to authenticity.com if you enjoy this episode please share it with someone leave us a review on apple podcasts or wherever you listen every little bit helps I want to thank the band punk rock opera whose music you hear throughout the show their songs are used with permission from the artist and under a Creative Commons license. If you're so inclined, check out the Patreon community 
as soon as I do these interviews, I upload them to Patreon um, where the content is only available to patrons. And for just a couple bucks a month, I usually post audio content there, exclusive audio content, probably eight times a month, if not more. And as these new episodes are released, as soon as they're done, they're available to patrons. So sometimes that might be two weeks before an episode is released or even longer. Usually it's a few days. Anyway, if you want to support the show, that's a great way to do it. So thanks again for investing your time. It's a big deal to me. Thank you for supporting me and supporting the show. I hope you keep coming back. Be nice. That's our story. I hope you enjoyed the punk rock opera. We have one last piece of music for you. It goes like this. Okay, go.
Thank you. Good night.